I want to take this opportunity of welcoming each and every one of you to night number four of our prophecy seminar, night number four. It is such a delight to see those who are in the house this evening, welcome. Those who are joining us online, we want to welcome you. Let me see the hands in the house of those who have been with us all night so far since this prophecy seminar has began. All night so far. Amen, amen. All right, I see the hands waving. Online, if you have been with us all night so far, just put in the chat all. Just write the word all in the chat so we can know that you have been with us thus far all night. And I know you will agree with me that with this series that we are exploring, are there any good answers? I know you will agree with me that we have been getting good answers from the word of God. Amen? And we want to thank our presenter, Dr. Ainsworth Joseph, for exp expounding the word of God for us and just declaring from the word the answers to life's challenging questions as we go through these difficult, uncertain times. So again, welcome on behalf of the pastoral staff, and I know you will be blessed from your participation this evening. And remember, it is an interactive experience, so we want you to send in your questions over the chat or indicate that you would like to ask a question in the house. You can do the same thing. We will entertain your question, and your questions must be on tonight's topic as the discussion ensues. All right, so again, welcome everyone. May God richly bless you as we continue in this wonderful seminar. Are there any good answers? And yes, the answer is Jesus. Jesus is the answer. All right, in a couple of minutes, our presenter will be coming up to kick off session number five this evening. But before we do that, as we do each night, we have a special nugget for you. And this evening's nugget is presented by the health ministry on exercise. And so at this time, I want to invite our tech team to play that video for us. And following that video, the next voice you will hear is that of our presenter for the seminar, Dr. Ainsworth Joseph. God bless you. COVID-19 pre-screening was done on all participants. Did you know the COBRA pose holds a wealth of benefits for the whole body? This backbend can be subtle or dramatic depending on the depth to which you take it, the day you have had, and the general specifics of your body and your practice. However, no matter how deep your COBRA, this pose will physically influence your frontal and posterior planes from your toes to your chin. It will encourage positive changes in your internal organs and benefit your emotional well-being too. Welcome back to our workout sessions. Uh, name is Donald Henry, if you're a first time viewer. Um, in charge of an exercise session, as we said in previous sessions, that you should warm up for five to ten minutes, light stretches and so forth before you begin your exercise. So we are gonna, we do not have five to ten minutes, so ten minutes, we're going to show you a few exercises, a few stretches that you can do for one. So the first one we're gonna do is full bra position, which has lots of benefits.
Let me know what you did, guys. See you next day. Same time, same place. Thank you. COVID-19. Those of you who are in a place where you can do that, it's good to do it with them. And you get a free coaching and exercise for a few minutes. Uh, so we encourage those who are home, those who are on, on, uh, wherever you are in, a, in, in, in your office, uh, you, can, you can do that the, the evenings when we are offering the exercises. So I want to, again, thank the health ministries for providing us these little tidbits as we thank the family ministries last night. They're doing alternate nights. So we are giving you not just spiritual knowledge, but we are giving you physical knowledge and relational knowledge that can help you in these difficult days in which we are living. All right, so good evening, everybody. Good to see you one more time and uh, to our online uh, students and Participants, we want to also acknowledge you and thank you. Whatever platform you're on, we just appreciate that you are tuning in and you are engaging with us in this exercise. All right, I'm enjoying it so far. Every time I do the prophecies, I learn more. You never can sit back and say, oh, I know it all. Uh -uh. Every time I do it, I get deeper and better understanding of the prophecies. And that's what you will experience as well as you come night after night after night. Now, regarding the quiz, I, I understand that we, we, on Facebook we have Opal. All right, so Opal Morris Powell, congratulations on Facebook. And then the online uh, participants, that's those who passed the quiz last night. We have uh, Petrona Lindo and Cheryl A. Murray. And then on YouTube, we have Lorna Wright. Ricardo Hines, Jennifer Renard. These are people who are taking the quiz all outside their different places, wherever they can get it on, on YouTube, on, on Facebook, online, uh, our Zoom platform. And then we have those in the house, Lucilla Allen. These are the ones who, who passed the quiz. Lucilla? <laughs> Amen. Say amen to Lucilla. Oh, she wants you to know she passed the quiz. Amen. amen. Jasmine, Spence, uh, Grant, uh, Yvonne White, Oswald, Lewis. Amen. Come and put hands together for these people in the house who, who did a quiz. And uh, Angelina Owate again. All right. In the house. And those online who are taking it, we will be doing a weekly uh, tally to see who is the outstanding winner for the week. We will be giving a prize to outstanding, the outstanding winner. So keep on doing it. Don't become discouraged. You just might uh, benefit, win, get something out here just from engaging in the quiz. All right. Um, this is lesson number five. This is night number four. And we are moving well. We are moving well. We want to remind you that we do have some snacks to the back when you come every evening, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. We are providing you that if you come straight from work or from school, just to tide you over until you get home. All right? So it's available uh, to the rear. I believe if you have to go there, Sister Jasmine will be there to see you, and you can help yourself. All right? Uh, to the rear. Okay. Um, Let's jump right into it on tonight because we, we, we want to uh, have a, another item after engaging at around 8.30. So we want to get right into it tonight and, and then uh, 
see how fast we can move. We encourage those who are online, again, to give us your ideas. If anything we can do to help you out there, to engage with it better, let us know. You can call, you can text, you can uh, email. We'd be happy to hear. Some people have been doing that, and we appreciate that. But we just want to thank you for taking the time wherever you are to engage with us in this prophecy seminar. Let's all start in the house. Let's all start in the house. And let's sing our song, then we will offer a prayer, and we shall begin. Are there any good answers? The answer to that is yes. Jesus is the answer. Let's sing that song, our theme song for these meetings out here. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Come on, sing. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus, one more time. Sing with us out there on the YouTube. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Father, we are so, 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 so glad that with all the perplexing issues and all the questions that are man-boggling and troubling in the world today, we know that there are answers. In fact, there is the answer, and the answer is Jesus. So tonight we come again in his name to engage in this prophetic series that we will study Lesson number five, be with us and be our teacher, be our guide and bless us with divine enlightenment and understanding and may we be able to apply these prophecies to our lives as we see the signs fulfilling in the world and to be ready for the grand climax, the soon coming of Jesus and the ushering in of his kingdom. In his name I pray, let everyone say amen. Be seated in the presence of the Lord. And tonight we will be treating with a very important topic. And as you notice, we're getting into the symbols. So what we were doing for the last three or four sessions is we were just laying the foundation, but we're getting ready to get into the symbols. And it's going to get more and more intense and complex. That's why we said... The little things help you to get ready for the big things. So stick with us, stick with us online and in the house, we go in somewhere. So let's do the quiz quickly. Let's do the quiz as we move. Let's do the quiz, all right? Get your quiz card to be like this. Make sure you have a quiz card and have your pen ready, your pencil. If you are on the virtual platform, get ready to type or punch in the answer. And uh, we will see how well you do on tonight. So, based on last night's study, this is question number one. The book of Daniel contains many outline prophecies that outline world history from Daniel's time to the time of the end. True or false? Mark T or true or Mark true? F or false or Mark false on your card or punch in the answer online or type it in wherever you are taking the quiz. All right, number two, number two. The Babylonian wise men devised a, a false interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but fortunately, Daniel gave correct interpretation. All right? T or true, F or false. For that question, number two. Number three, the head of gold in Daniel II represented the nation of Babylon of which Nebuchadnezzar was the king. That's number three. Number three. Number four, the stone that crushed the image represents an atomic bomb that the United States drops on Russia. Why are you all laughing? 
I don't make a joke. <laughs> Your laugh could confuse the answer. <laughs> All right, good. Number five. The progression of the empires in Daniel 2 indicates that God is in full control of human history or human events. That's it. Progression of the empires in Daniel 2 indicates that God is in full control of human events. All right, let's see, let's see. Everybody should get all five tonight. Right hand, Sister Wati? Everybody. Don't, you all got to watch her, you know, you see her? Huh? She's the A student right here. <laughs> all you all watch her. Somebody got to come and come take her on. I want somebody to take her on. Okay, let's see. How many got all five tonight? All right, I see two hands. Wow. Okay, let's see. Let's see, let's see what you did. Okay, number one. What did you have for that? True? Right, good, good. Number two. Did somebody say true? Everybody said false? All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Number three. Somebody said false? Number four. You all sure? You all very sure, right? <laughs> okay, okay, all right. And number five. You better have truth for that one. Better have truth for that one. All right, thank you. Very well. So, how many got all five? All right. And in the meantime, you can put your love offering in the envelope. If you're online, you can, you can send a love gift uh, using the platform that you see out there. Uh, our Zelle and the online giving. Give us an offering to help uh, with the expense. As, 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 as simple as this looks, it takes money to conduct a seminar like this. And nothing goes into the teacher's pocket because I am salaried to do this. So. It just helps us to defray some of the expenses from getting a seminar like this going, materials cost. All right, um, tonight we're looking at conflict over false worship. Conflict over false worship. We already prayed, so we will get going. Daniel chapter 3, open your Bibles there. We are staying there, uh, perusing there for most of the night we'll be cruising through Daniel chapter 3 as we cruise through Daniel chapter 2 last evening. All right, let's go. Let's go. So, again, we like to give you facts. So, every once in a while, we drop some facts right before you that you can see, think about it, turn it around on your head, and, you know, see what, if it makes sense. So, let's, let's look at, at, at this here. The stories in the book of Daniel are not bedtime stories. Mm -mm. They are forewarning to the Christians. They are a forewarning to the Christians. In the end time, describing what to expect if they would be faithful to Jesus. They are a forewarning. They form a forewarning to the Christians. In the end time, if they would be ready but when Jesus comes, they will be faithful and be ready for when he comes. All right? So they're, they're not bad time stories. They're, they're serious. Uh, uh, in, information that God wants us to know to be ready for when he comes. So let's look at some other facts. So in, in Daniel, as we will see tonight, false worship will be enforced. And true worship will be forbidden. That's another fact. False worship will be made to be at the forefront and commanded that everyone would do it, adhere to it. And true worship at some point will be stopped, blocked, 
relegated, forbidden. It's a fact. So the great image that Daniel set up is what we will pay some attention to here now. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 1 uh, is our first verse, and again, we are cruising through Daniel chapter 3 on tonight, okay? So describe the image that Nebuchadnezzar set up. Reader, let's hear that image, what it was like. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Wow, so the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar established an image. Now keep in mind, based on last night's study, Nebuchadnezzar dreamt about an image. Remember that, right? The image was not of pure gold. You remember that as well? So already you're seeing here that Nebuchadnezzar is going to be defiant. He's going to be defiant to God. God said to Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold, but now he's constructing an image all of gold. And he set it up in the plate of Dura. Now, uh, when we look at the, the specifications here of this image in Daniel 3 and 1, the Bible says the height was, what, 660 cubics? And its width was 6. So it's approximately, this image was... Nine feet wide by 90 feet tall. That's huge. <laughs> you can't miss it. I would, uh, the closest semblance that I say that I, that I can say no to that is Lady Liberty. That you can see from a distance on the Hudson or if you're driving some parts of Jersey or New York City, you'll see Lady Liberty from a distance, or even from the air when you're flying. So this image could not have been missed in the plain of Dura. Nine feet by 90 feet, huge, gigantic image, all of gold. Now keep in mind, remember that Babylon was the golden monarchy, golden kingdom. So Nebuchadnezzar heard what Daniel taught, and, and, and even though he, he praised Daniel's God for giving him the dream and the interpretation, now he goes contrary to the dream. Human beings just have this tendency to go contrary, and especially to what God says. So he decides, okay, yes, it's an image. And like Frank Sinatra, I'm going to do it not God's way, I'm going to do it my way. So God said, gold, uh-huh, and then what, silver, brass, iron, iron and clay, God, I got you, but I'll do it my way. I'm going to set this thing up, all of gold, as a defiant act that Babylon will reign forever long, live the king. Well, you know, we studied last night that God sets up. And he takes them. What an awesome God we serve. Let's go on. So, again, we discovered, we, 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 we dealt with the specification. All right? And now, he set this thing up in the plain of Dura. A strategic place in the Babylonian prophets. Now, it was not just established, but now he is having a, a like a dedication we had a groundbreaking ceremony just a few weeks ago where we invited people to come, and the mayor, the mayor was here to break ground for a new building that we are erecting just over the street here. It was something like that where he was having, but in this case, we are starting. He set this thing up, and he says, everybody come down to Dura. Everybody must come down. It was a command. You got to come down. We are having a dedication. We are having a service, a spiritual service. We are dedicating a service. Let's see what the text says in Daniel chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces 
to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image which Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So it was a big occasion. It was a big dedication, big celebration. And all the authorities were there. We had the mayor here, but everybody came for this. The prophet, everybody. And look at, you got to understand this. People did not just go down to Dura by curiosity. Huh? The king said you had to come. Everybody had to come. You had to drop what you're doing and come down to the plain of Dura to the dedication of this image. From princes, governors, captains, judges, treasurers, counselors, sheriffs, all the rulers, and all the subjects, they had to come down. But they, they, you couldn't say, well, I, I want sick leave today, and, and, and I couldn't have been there. But there's, there's going to be something interesting here, you know, because somebody was missing, but for whatever reason. But everyone else had to be present. So they came down. They came down. And what were all these rulers to do when the music sounded? Uh, again, Daniel chapter 3, verses 3 to 5. It's a dedication service. Now, <laughs> really, it was a worship in disguise. He says, come to a dedication, but it really was a worship service. Let's see what happens. Daniel 3, 3 to 5. Then the princes, the governors, and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried out, To you it is commanded, <gasps> O people, nations, and language, that at the time ye hear the sound of the horn cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. My Lord, notice the key word, commanded. He invited them to a dedication. They got there. Now he says, it is commanded. When the music strikes, get dung. Everybody get dung and worship. Bow dung before this gigantic image. Image. That was a command. And I notice we, we, we established up front that false worship will be commanded and true worship will be forbidden. It happened before, it will happen again. History has a way of repeating itself. It happened. It's going to happen again. And we are seeing shades of it already in our day and time. So what penalty would be received by those who fail to worship the image? So if the king gives a command and you refuse to heed the king's command, there is a consequence. A penalty. What's the penalty? In verse number six. And whoso fall it not down and worship it, Shall, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace? The same hour. The penalty, you will be thrown into fire, a burning fiery furnace, if you fail to fall down and worship. Last night, we established that if you cannot stand for small things, you will fall for anything and everything and the big things. From Daniel chapter 1, we see Daniel and Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, which is Sedrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they began practicing standing for the little things as food, as, as liquor, alcohol that they were given. You know, they, 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 they began to stand up for little things like that, a diet. So that now when a big challenge comes, we will see how they fared, what they did. 
All right, so those who refuse, and again, the bow down shall be tossed into fire, burning fiery furnace and inferno. Who would want to be that? So let's, let's do something here, summary quite quickly here. A powerful world leader commands false worship. Who was he? What was his name? Talk to me, class. Nebuchadnezzar, a powerful world leader at that time, commands false worship. Number two, refusal to worship falsely would be treason to the state. If the commander, the king, says to do so and you refuse, that's treason. If you are, if you are a citizen or resident, if you're living there, and the king says so, you do so. Then uh, basic issues are again, what everybody? Come and talk to me, come and talk to me. What are the basic issues? Worship and obedience. God's law versus man's law. And we established last night in Acts 5.29 and the night before, Whenever human law conflicts with God's law, Acts 5.29 says, you ought to obey God rather than. Number four, the law was universal. It was for everybody to, to, to obey. Everybody. None was to escape that. Everybody had to obey. If you, would, you had to follow and worship. There was no exception to that. Number five, the effort here was an effort of a union of church and state. Notice, he called them to a dedication, but then they found themselves in a worship service. Disguised. Very, very subterfuge in his clandestine, in his movement and intent. Dedication turned into worship. And then the penalty was death. If you don't worship, you're dead. You finish. We destroy you. Obliterate you. So let's look at a warning here. This represents the condition in the in, in the world at the end of time. The same thing that happened in Dura and Babylon will happen in the world at the end of time. When God is about to deal with that iron and clay monarchy, before he does that, we will have the same thing happening. We're going to have true worship forbidden and false worship enforced, commanded. And it's going to be universal. Everyone will have to do it. And if you don't, death. Are you ready? You ready for that? To be ready, you've got to stand for the little things now. If you keep falling for all the little things, we're not going to stand up when that comes. And ready or not, <laughs> it's coming. Believe it or not, it's coming. So a refusal to worship false, let's take a quick look as we look at what charge did the Chaldeans make concerning certain Jews. Daniel 3, 7 to 12, there a charge came to the king. Let's read that. What was the charge? Therefore, at that time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, psaltery, and all kind of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near mm. and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. My Lord. There are certain Jews. There are who? 
Certain Jews, certain Jews, pay whom attention. Thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. There are certain Jews. It will be said one day, there are certain Christians. There are a group of people called Adventists. There are certain Sabbath keepers. It's going to happen again. There are certain Jews. All right? They serve not thy gods. I, you know, and they were correct. They were correct. Because it was not just a dedication of an image which was defiant in the first place, but it was a worship to the God of Babylon, the gods of Babylon. They were correcting their child. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. They were quite correct in their assessment. They serve not thy gods. So what command uh, forbade false worship? This is a very, uh, forbade false worship. All right, Exodus 20, 46. God was very clear. He says what he means, means what he says. Let's read that text. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, nor that is in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. God already had established that we, first of all, should not make any graven images, number one. Then he says, don't bow down thyself to them. It's in the commandments, the second commandments, the Decalogue that God gave to Moses for humankind. God says, don't make any graven image. Don't bow down yourself don't worship them. So the Hebrew boys were very clear in who they worship, why they worship, what they worship. So they, they stood tall. And so the accusations that came to the king by certain Chaldeans, they were correct. There's a group of people who are defiant. They are not worshiping. They don't serve your God. They were correct. And so they reminded the king that you said that if they don't, whoever failed to worship, they should be thrown into the burning fiery footage. You said so. So did the three Hebrews need time to think it over? Daniel 3.16, what was their response? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. They didn't need time to think, to process, to talk to a pastor, to talk to a family member, to get some advice. They didn't, you know, when the king, when they were reminded of what the, the, the punishment would have been, that you should be cast in a fiery furnace. They said to the king, look, we don't even need time to think or to respond to you on this matter. We already have our answers. They said, we are not careful to even answer you on this matter. We don't even want to discuss this. There's no discussion here. There's no negotiation here. And, you know, sometimes we get in trouble with, 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 with God's commandments because we're negotiating with the devil. We're having discussion. If God says no, it is no. There's no reason to discuss and turn over the head and negotiate, all right? So how did the Hebrews respond to Nebuchadnezzar's offer for a second chance? So when he heard them the first time, he loved them because they were honored, they were honored uh, civilians. They worked for him, and they were good workers, honest people of integrity, Hard-working, responsible. So the king 
wanted to give a second chance to them. Daniel chapter 3, 17 and 18. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hadst set up. So, they, I mean, what, what, a, what a stout response. We don't want to discuss with you and you give a second chance. Well, you give a second chance, you look, you could do what you got to do. Because we already know what we have done, not will do, but have done and decided. And, and our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. Notice that the, the accusation was that they are not serving your gods. Now they're saying to him, our God is able to deliver us from your hands and from the burning fiery furnace. But if he chooses not to do so, we're still not going to bow down. We're not going to worship your gods and the golden image which you have set up. What a stout response. But they were able to say that because they were standing for the small things. So now they can stand for the big things. Now, I want us to understand here that deliverance is not the issue. The Hebrew boys had no, no concern with deliverance. That was not the issue for them. The issue here was what, everybody? I mean, talk to me. Obedience. Obedience. When they obey, everything is they leave in God's hands. Let God do what God will do. Our job is not to figure out how to get out of trouble. Our job is to trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, as the song says, but to trust and obey. That's what we do. Deliverance is not an issue. Obedience. So though he slay me, Job said these words, though he slay me, and he can go up on the screen, but I will, I'll read it right here. Job says, if even, Job was in a predicament as well, and he says, if even God slays me, yet will I trust him. I'm not going to give up my hope and my belief and my faith in him, my trust in him. Job 13, 15. If even God is doing this to me when Job was suffering, remember he lost his, his, his children, his animals, his health, his life was ebbing away. His friends turned against him. Even his wife said, well, maybe it's time to curse God and I. <laughs> he says, if even God is the one doing this to me, I still trust him. I still trust in him. All right? So the fiery furnace was set up, and how did Nebuchadnezzar respond to the Hebrews when they gave that stout response in Daniel 3 and verse number 19? Then Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, hmm. and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hmm. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Wow. The king is mad. Somebody say mad. <laughs> you ever see somebody who's really mad? <laughs> You know what came to my mind as I thought about that? Madea. Oh, Bo. Who will just take a can, run it into people, and have a gun, and just want to go shoot at people. Po Bo. The king got so mad that he, he said, turn the heat up. Turn it up. Seven times hotter. Seven times. Turn it up. My Lord. You know, friends of mine, tonight, online, and those in the house, God's people again will go through the heat of the furnace called persecution. Are you ready for that? If you can't stand for the little things now, you're not going to stand for that big thing then. But notice here, we don't, Daniel and they were not concerned about deliverance. They were concerned about obedience. When you obey, it's on God. It's all on God, not on you. So, seven times harder. That's what they're going into for defying the king, for treason. 
So what happened to the soldiers? So, 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 so now the king knew that these guys would not change their minds. They would not bow down. They, would, they made him look, in other words, they made him look bad. He's a king, and here his, his employees and his subjects talking to him like that, and they would not even, even acquiesce to his, his you know, uh, suggestions over suggestions and second chances. So the king got angry. Fiery furnace heated up. Heat it up. The, 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 the heating of the furnace was also a symbol of the heating of his own anger that boiled within him. His, the thermometer rose within him because they were defying him. His ego was challenged, and so now they're going to go. And so he told, uh, he told some of his soldiers, some of his men to take them, cast them in. Daniel 3.22, let's see what happens. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent, and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Our God is an awesome God. God's ways are past finding out. And, and he told us in Isaiah 43, that's not in the lesson, but he says, when you, when you pass through the waters, you will not be, you know the text, you wouldn't be drowned. When you walk through the fires, you would not be Burn when you're doing it for my sake and in my name and you are my child, you're going to be protected. You'll be shielded. But the amazing thing is here that the men who bound up the hands and feet of those Hebrew boys lifted them up and tossed them into the fire. Those men fell dead from the scorching heat. Even before the Hebrew boys reached the fires, they tossed them in, the men who tossed them in fell back. They fell dead on the ground. That's how hot this thing was. So how were the three Hebrew boys thrown into the fiery furnace? Daniel 3.23. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego fell down bound in the midst of the fiery furnace. Don't miss that. The men who threw them in fell down and died, died from the heat. They were tossed in, bound, and they also fell down. They were tossed in. So they're supposed to be <laughs> dead, finished with. But something happened. They fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. They fell down. They were bound. Their hands, their feet, they fell down. The men who threw them in, they were, they were not bound, but they fell down and they died from the heat. Just getting too close to the, to the oven killed them. So when Nebuchadnezzar looked inside the furnace again, he saw a very startling uh, thing in Daniel chapter 3 24 and 25. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spoke and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Come on. Thank you for that. Amen. I would be shouting hallelujah here and now. Because this is encouraging for me and for you who will face trials and tribulations and persecutions in the last days, the Bible says they were tossed in their bound hands and feet. The men who tossed them in fell dead on the ground. They fell on the ground, bound hands and feet. But then when a king looked into the furnace, into that big oven that he established, he did seven times. The Bible says he saw them loose. Come on, somebody. And not only loose, but they were not on the ground. They were walking <laughs> in the midst of the fire. And they had no hurt. My Lord. No hurt. That was an amazing thing. The king 
the king was astonished. And of course, Daniel 3.25, he says, look, I see four. Not just seeing the three men who I tossed in there, but I'm seeing another person. Hello. <laughs> and the fourth one, he says, the fourth one, Daniel 3.25, the fourth one. I cast in three, bound, but they're up, walking, no hurt. And the fourth one, I see another person with them, and the fourth one looks like the Son of God. Friends of mine tonight, you know, God comes into the furnace with his people when they stand up for him. He might be quiet. Somebody said, be shouting, hallelujah. Say it louder than that. The furnace that your boss makes for you, that even some family members make for you, that your neighbor makes for you, that the devil makes for you and for me, when, when we are in it, if we have to go in, Jesus comes in with us. Come on, somebody say amen. We're not there alone. And he don't come in there just for style. He comes in there to deliver. Come on, say amen for that one. So hang in there when you're facing issues and trials. and pers- Hang in there. Serve God. Be obedient. He is with you. So how did Nebuchadnezzar address Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? He, these, these are their Babylonian names, okay? All right? They were Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael. These were the Hebrew names, but they, their names were changed. Now Daniel 3.26, he sees the three men in the fire. He sees a fort. How did he address them in 3.26? Then Nebuchadnezzar came near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace, and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most Ooh. High God, come forth, come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth in the midst of the fire. All right. Now, now look at how he is addressing them. Now notice this thing began, this whole trouble began by some Chaldeans going to the king and saying that these men are not serving thy gods. They are defying you and your gods. And that's treason. He did all that he had to do, and we know the end result here now when he's addressing them as what? Servants of the most high God. Not just servants of God, but servants of the most high. Hi, God. We have gods in Babylon, but your God is higher than all gods. And you are serving the most high God. What a testimony. What a testimony. So after seeing this display of God's power... What decree did Nebuchadnezzar make in Daniel chapter 3, verses 27 to 30? 30, He sees the awesome power of God. Now he makes a decree. Let's, Let's read those verses. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together, saw these men upon whose body the fire had no power. No power. Nor was an hair on their head singed. Mm. Neither was their coats changed nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and delivered his servants that trust in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own God. Therefore, Mm. I make a decree Mm. that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amidst against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God wow. that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Wow. Look at the words of the king. First of all, not even the smell of smoke on these men. And then he, be, he began to, as we say, big up their God. <laughs> you know, there's no God that could deliver like their God. Now he makes a decree that nobody should speak ill, speak against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But let me say this here. Let me say this. This is not in the lesson, but I need to say this. God does not need and want any monarch on earth to make a decree to protect him. i say it again. God, the God of heaven, the God of Daniel, Ananias, Azariah, Mishael, your God, my God, does not need any human monarch to make any decree to protect him. I'll say it again. God of Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, Ainsworth, Harold, Bobby, Isabel, <laughs> Angelina, Lewis, and I could go on and on. God does not need any earthly monarch to sign any decree to protect him. Now the king saw the display of God's power. He, he feels he could do something to protect God. God doesn't need protection. What, in fact, what God needed was Nebuchadnezzar's obedience, not his protection. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. It, it only shows how we could go from one extreme to the other as human beings. From one extreme to the other. Totally against God. Now he's trying to be overprotective protective of God. God doesn't need that. What he wants is obedience. So don't speak against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Don't say a word against him because if you do, he, he, he says, <laughs> you go, I'll cut you up into pieces. <laughs> if you speak against the God, I'll cut you into pieces. <laughs> and your houses shall be made a dunghill. And there's no God that can deliver. That, that part is correct. That's the one good thing that he should have said and stay right there. There's no God that can deliver after this sort. No God. Here's a fact. There's no new thing under the sun. Especially at the end of time. What happened in Babylon will happen again. And if you and I live long enough, we'll experience it. Let's go. Race on to a close. Revelation chapter 30, we head into the back of the book because this is a prophecy seminar and a prophecy seminar ties in the book of Daniel and the Revelation. All right, we show you the whole spectrum and we show you how they are interconnected and how things will play out. Let's go to Revelation chapter 13, the very last book of the Bible as we try to bring this thing home. Revelation 13, all right? So what does the... Uh, Make sure the two horn. The Bible talks about the two horn beast. We're going to break it down later on. There's a two horn beast. We, you're going to get more and more knowledge of that as we go along in this study. But Revelation 13, 11 and 12 says, so what does the two horn beast command the people of earth to do? Let's take a look at that. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Mm. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, this, Daniel said that this is what happened in Babylon. John says this will happen at the end of time. This has not happened yet. It's still to come. What it is that John says will happen that there'll be another power on earth, another kingdom on earth that will cause people to worship, force people to worship the first beast. We should, we should talk about these in more details later on. 
Now, after bringing fire down from heaven and performing other miracles, what does this beast declare the people should make? Revelation 13, 13 and 14. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire, fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth mm -hmm. by, the, by any means, or by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So the Bible says that this power that will also enforce worship in, in, at the end of time will do something. He will make an image to the beast. We hear a lot about the mark of the beast, and people don't even know what it is. And we're going to be talking about that because I, I was so surprised when I see many people were confused with the mark of the beast, and they were calling COVID-19 vaccine the mark of the beast. Even, even, even Adventist Christians. Yeah. People who are supposed to know better were calling COVID the mark of the beast. That means they don't even know what the word of God is to 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 because that's not how it's gonna be in the first place. It's coming. False worship again is coming. An image is coming again that people will be made to worship. Now, what are the people asked to do to the image of a beast in Revelation 13 and verse number 15? It's coming again. We have Revelation 13, 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So the people are asked to worship. Again, in Daniel, we see the two key issues out of everybody. Worship and obedience. The same thing plays out in the book of Revelation. That's why they are interconnected. God gave these visions to these two men hundreds and hundreds of years apart. And they are so related. And uh, they pretty much almost fulfill, are almost fulfilled. We saw the image last night and we are down to the divided Europe. The feet and toes of that image that they are still trying to unite. And we talk about Grexit and Brexit and Brexit and X and 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 and, and, Frexit and all of these nations that would pull away. The Bible said they not going to cleave. So we are right there, but then coming up sometime in in the end of time in which we are living, people again will be called to worship. They be called to worship the beast, image of the beast. What will happen to those who refuse to worship the image of the beast in Revelation thirteen fifteen? What will happen? And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. My Lord, yes. <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace because they refused to worship the golden image in the plain of Dura that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. John in Revelation says that there will be another image that will be established that people will be called upon to worship and those who refuse to worship, Revelation 13 15 says, they will be what? That will be the command. Kill them. What happens? What happened in history will happen again until all prophecy is fulfilled. All right? So during this seminar, we want you to consider these two, these two words, image and beast. Image and beast. I told you at the very beginning on, on Sabbath morning that in Bible prophecy, beast means what? On. You are students, I should give you another test here. What does beast mean? A kingdom. Say it like you know it. Beast is a? Kingdom. 
And those who are on the voting platform, you could type kingdom. A beast is symbolic of a kingdom in Bible prophecy. And so, if there is an image to the beast, what is that? Huh? Another kingdom. <laughs> so, these two words, I wanted to keep them in perspective and in mind. Image and beast, okay? Now, what other restrictions will be placed upon those who refuse to worship the beast and receive his mark? In Revelation 13, 16, and 17, what restrictions will be placed? And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bound, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he has had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. All right, so the Bible says that they will not be able to buy or sell unless they have the mark of the beast. You can't buy groceries. You can sell your car. You can sell your house and go back in the Caribbean. <laughs> and if you keep your house, you cannot buy heating oil and gas. Unless you have the mark of the beast. You cannot buy metro cards to get in the subway and go anywhere. You can't buy a plane ticket. You can't buy a bus ticket. Unless you have the mark of the beast. We have a full topic on the mark of the beast that will be treated separately coming up down the road almost to the end. It's coming up. Full topic on the mark of the beast. But people don't understand this thing and all kinds of cries go there and people are so gullible that they jump behind these conspiracy theorists out there. Oh, the mark of the beast. This is the mark of the beast. The COVID-19 vaccine. Oh, the injection. Or the, 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 the forcing people. The mark of the beast. Hey, folk, wake up. Because the devil has a way of putting all of these pseudo things to confuse us. And when a real thing comes, we will get caught. Better wake up. And know your Bible. Know your word. And know Jesus. So that you will not be trapped by the conspirators that we have now. Know the real mark of the beast when it happens. So when the beast calls for people to worship its image, whom does God ask them to worship in Revelation 14, 7? Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. So in contrast to the call of the beasts to worship the image, God says, what everybody? Worship him who is creator, the one who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountain of water. Worship the creator. He is the one who is deserving of a worship. So where will those who get the victory over the beast and his image ultimately stand? Revelation 15, 2. This is, this is, this is good because what, what this text is saying here. And and I so saw, say, wait, be, 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 what the text is saying here is that there will be people who will be victorious over the beast. Did you get that? The question is presupposing and suggesting Revelation 15, 2, that there are people who will be victorious over the beast. As Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, Mishael were victorious over Nebuchadnezzar and the burning fiery furnace. God's people will be victorious. Let's read that text in Revelation 15 too. As it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name Stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. That's the best that John could have described. John says, those who are victorious, he saw them standing in a, on the sea of glass. It may not be a real sea. That's, the, that's what he saw. This dazzling beauty and, and transparency under their feet. He saw them standing in a victorious posture and in a place of victory. 
God's people who are faithful will always be victorious. So tonight, 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 having gone through this study, are you willing to make serving God the chief priority of your life? The issue always is obedience. Well, ah, always obedience and worship. Two issues, really. Two issues, obedience and worship. Who you worship, why you worship, what you worship, when you worship, how you worship. It's not about deliverance. God will take up deliverance. You, 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 you obey God and he will handle the deliverance part of it. Your job is simply to be obedient. Tonight, if you want to be obedient, just bow before Jesus Christ at the foot of the cross and say, God, just give me the strength. Just give me the victory. Help me to be an overcomer. Help me to be like the Hebrews, to stand up. Even now, when the little things that I will stand up, then when the big test and trial comes. So what have we learned tonight from the lesson? Counterfeits will appear the same as the truth at the end of time. We learned that. Counterfeits will appear as truth. We are warned about the union of church and state. The church must remain church and the state must remain state. Yes, there are things we can do together. That's not religious. We could help people. We could help suffering people. We do that, the church and the state. But when it comes to spiritual matters, when it comes to religious matters, when it comes to serving God, the church and state must remain separate. They can't unite. Obedience is the real issue. Obedience. We will, rem we will remain faithful only if we have an obedient relationship with Jesus Christ. It don't happen overnight. It has to start now in the little things. So Daniel 3 and Revelation 13 teach us the same message, the same thing. It happened in Daniel's day, Daniel chapter 3. John says in Revelation 13, it's going to happen in the last days. And so tonight, get your quiz card, your quiz card out and give, give the response as we close. Do you clearly see that the issues in the last day will be the same as they were in Daniel's day? The issue of worship and obedience. If so, place a check mark in box number one. God sees that. And we pray over that. You put a check mark in box number one. Is it your desire to be faithful to God in the final crisis? As the three Hebrew boys were faithful to God in the crisis they faced in ancient Babylon, if that is your desire, put a check mark in box number two. Thank you for tonight. We're going to look tomorrow night at conflict results in conversion tomorrow night. Thank you for your love gifts that you are giving to God because God has blessed you. If God has blessed you, say amen, everybody. If you are learning something, say amen. amen. If you are being refreshed in what you already know, say amen. And on the, on, the, on, the, on the virtual platform, type in the chat and say, yes, I'm learning. I'm being refreshed. I'm being inspired. I'm being encouraged. I'm being strengthened to serve God in these last days. Stand your feet as we pray and close out and send you home. God bless you. Have a good night. And we shall see you on tomorrow night. Father, we thank you tonight again for another sterling message that... Worship, just as it was forced in Daniel's day, will be forced again in our day. False worship will be enforced and true worship will be forbidden. But like the Hebrews, we got to know where we stand. Not on that great day. We got to know where we stand now so that we can stand on that great day. Help us to stand up in the little things, the little tests, the little trials. that we shall be able to stand when that big test and trial comes. Bless the offerings that your people have given tonight to defray the expenses of these meetings. Even those on the virtual platform who will give us virtually by your zeal and online giving. Bless their gifts as well. And may we all... Commit to be faithful to you now that we shall be faithful to you on that great day. Take us to our home safely. Give us a good night's rest and bring us again tomorrow night as we shall continue in this study, Conflict 
results in conversion. God bless you. See you tomorrow night. Have a good night. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way as you go. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Amen.